and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that as we look at it together this morning, you will speak to us from it, give us eyes to see and ears to truly hear from you. Amen. So uh, let me ask you a question to begin. Uh, who, who's coming for Christmas this year? Have you got some people coming for Christmas? Maybe some of you? Yeah, no one's miserable lot. Yeah, one or two people got someone coming. Anybody going anywhere for Christmas? Yes? Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's all very exciting, isn't it? Okay. It's funny, isn't it? It's possibly the first Christmas since 2019 when we're actually in a situation where we think we might be able to have a normal Christmas. And the plans that we've made might actually work out. Remember this time last year, we started having uh, the Omicron, the final uh, COVID variant by name, uh, that, uh, that, that we were starting to be concerned about. It was just around about this time of year that the concern raised. And so those plans that we'd started to have last year about who we were going to have for Christmas, well, we found that some of them didn't quite work out. This year, we might have a fairly normal Christmas. Who knows? There's always a possibility. So what we'll be doing, well, I suspect for some of us, we'll be catching up with family and we'll be catching up with people who we've seen quite a bit. Okay, that's been great. We've kept in touch with them. We've seen them a fair amount. Uh, we've, uh, we've spent plenty of time with them uh, over the last year or so since we've been able to. Fantastic. But I also suspect that this might be the Christmas where we actually see some people we haven't seen since before the pandemic. Some of those kind of cousins, those, those sort of once and twice removed nephew type people that we have. You know those people that you sort of, they're family, but you're not quite sure how. You know you're related, but you wouldn't want to have to describe it, okay? I suspect there are still some of those people around that we really haven't seen for three years, maybe more. The kind of people that you might only see uh, at a wedding or even, I dare say, a funeral. There is something, isn't there, about this Christmas, about this time of year, that is about renewing relationship. They're not people you don't know, but actually it's been so long since you've seen them that, in a way, you've kind of forgotten a little bit about them. You kind of need to renew that relationship. Relationships work a little bit like that, don't they? You do need to keep renewing them. It's like sort of Zoom. You can do Zoom things for a while, but after a while, you need to see people face to face. You can work off memory for a while, but then you kind of need to see people face to face. You need to renew that relationship. And that's really what we're up to uh, as we come to John's Gospel. We're starting John's Gospel uh, today. You might think, are we just doing a very short series on John? No. We're going to do a couple of weeks now, and then we'll come back to it uh, in the new year. Why are we doing John now? Well, because we finished doing James. Couldn't make that spin that out any longer. That's one of the reasons. But also because this is actually quite a nice time to start thinking and beginning a gospel in the season of Advent. Because obviously the first bit of the gospel is usually quite Christmassy. Okay? We'll come to John 1 as to whether it's Christmassy or not in a minute. But they're usually something to do with Christmas, something to do with the first coming of Jesus Christ. And yet, of course, we're in the season of Advent, aren't we? And as I tell you every year, Advent is not about looking forward to Christmas. It's about looking forward to... <sighs> every year for six years. Four times every year for six years. That's 20-odd. Come on. It's about looking forward to Jesus Christ's return, isn't it? Okay? I think James may have had a valid point earlier about Luke's gospel. Uh, it is about looking forward to Jesus' return. So we've got that in mind as well. And that's really what we've been thinking about, isn't it? That promise that Jesus Christ is coming back. So really our theme uh, as we come to John's Gospel then is this. We are getting to know better somebody that many of us already know, Jesus. But maybe for some of us, honestly, we're getting to know someone who we don't know very well, who has always kind of been that second cousin twice removed, aware of but not really sure even what they do as a day job. So let's get into John's gospel as we do that. Do turn with me to John 1 as we think about renewing our relationship with Jesus. And John wants us to do that, and the first way he wants us to do that is by thinking big picture about who Jesus is, uh, the Word. And that's really where we are today with this 
introduction to the gospel. Three things that we need to know about the word, about Jesus today. So let's have a look at them together and let's think about what they mean for us. The first is that the eternal word is light and life. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We begin with this word, the word. We capitalize it because we're talking about a name. We're talking about a person. Not talking about an idea, a thing. We're talking about a person. And by the time we get to John's Gospel, if we've read through our Old Testament, we're already quite familiar with the idea of the Word of God. We're quite familiar with the idea of God's powerful Word. Think about that reading we have from Genesis 1. And God said, and it was so. But we're also familiar with the idea of the Word coming from God and the Word revealing God. And that's really what John is doing. That's why he uses this word, Word. That's why he describes Jesus as the Word. God speaks and makes himself known. And so John tells us some very, very important things about the Word. He tells us that the Word was there in the beginning. And you're thinking, in the beginning, I'm sure I've heard those words before. And yes, you have. They are very deliberately the beginning of Genesis 1. These are the words that John echoes here. In the beginning, the Word was with God. This is about the pre-existence of the Word. Before the beginning, the Word was. Which, of course, means, as we're told later on, that the Word was God. Because only God is there before the beginning. When the universe is created, the only thing that exists, the only one who exists, is the creator. That's the big distinction, of course, isn't it? That's the big distinction in being between us and God. God is the creator. He is pre-existent. He is before everything. And he is the one who creates, who makes all things. He is the creator. Everything else is created. Okay? Amazing what the ending of a verb does, does, isn't it? Created. That's who we are. Okay? That is the basic distinction in definition. There are two classes of being in the universe. Creator, created. Which side of that line does the Word fit? The Word was with God in the beginning and was God. The Word is our Creator. These are big things that John wants us to grasp about the Word, about, as we'll discover later, Jesus. Notice one little other thing here. The Word was with God. We're talking about relationship here, aren't we? We know, don't we, because we say it when we, uh, when we talk about the creed. We know that we believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's passages like these that help us to understand that from the New Testament. That in the beginning, the Word was with God. He is God, but somehow also, there is a distinction between God, who we know as Father, and the Word, who we know as God the Son, and we start to glimpse that in these opening verses of John. So there's no snow so far, there's no donkeys, there's no manger, there's no Zechariah, there's no Elizabeth, John the Baptist is going to come a little bit later. I haven't seen any kings, and no angels have appeared. And yet we're being told, aren't we, about Jesus Christ, the one who was born in a manger in Bethlehem. We're going to get there, but we need to know some more things about him first. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Well, this all makes sense now, doesn't it? Of course, the word is the creator because the word is with God, creation came through the Word. And therefore, life 
comes through the word. That life, of course, is created life. God is the one who breathes life into everything. But at the same time, there's another way of thinking about life, isn't there? The life that is given, the gift of life to all those who trust in God. Salvation is life. And so when we say in him was life, the word was life, yes, we're thinking about the, that created life, but we're also thinking about the saving life. We're starting to think about what it is that Jesus Christ, the word, came to do. We're starting to think about him, as verse 4 says, as the light of men. Notice what this light does, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so now we get a preview of what's to come. And at one level, it's a very positive preview, isn't it? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. There's a very positive image, isn't there, about a light. Maybe some of us have, have done that on a dark day. On a, maybe we've uh, got caught out walking somewhere a little bit later than we should have done. Uh, and we are reliant on lights. And those lights shine brightly for us. And we head towards them. And we know we need them. And they are very positive, And we're very glad that they are there. Very positive image, that, isn't it? The light shining in the darkness. But... Negatively as well, there's darkness. The darkness is there. And the darkness very often in the Bible is a, uh, is a symbol of, uh, of evil, of uh, those who are opposed to God. That, that opposition between light and dark is often an opposition between truth and evil, between right and wrong, between good and bad. And so the light comes, but the light is shining in the darkness. So what do we do with all this? The eternal word is light and life. The first thing I think we need to do is mentally to take a deep breath, okay? Because John really wants us to think big, doesn't he? He doesn't want us to skip through this too quickly just so we can get to the action that starts in, I don't know, verse 19 or wherever. He really wants us to pause and to think about who the Word is. Now, the Word is, of course, Jesus. We know that. We know that this is the gospel about Jesus Christ. John's readers knew that, but John uses this other title just to say, well, I want you to think a little bit more about who this is. So take a deep breath and take some of this in. Think about this for a minute. Then notice these things. Notice that it is the Word, it is Jesus Christ who reveals God. If we want to get to know God, we get to know Him through the Word, through Jesus Christ. It's very interesting in our world, and I think this has been true forever, it's certainly true today, that when you talk about God, people are often very happy with that conversation. And the reason that people are very happy with a conversation about God is that in the English language, like in many languages, that word God, well, it's a bit vague. You can think of God in all manner of different ways. And we know, don't we, that there are many religions, many spiritualities that wouldn't call themselves religions, many ideas about how you can get to God or about how you can... Get God to do the things that you want him to do. We were talking a bit about that uh, last week. About how God works, about what God's up to, about what God wants. And all those ideas, they're very sort of vague, very amorphous. They're probably quite sort of self-contradictory, but never mind because you can believe what you like about God. But you try introducing Jesus into the conversation. And I promise you the conversation gets a little bit sharper. Why? Because Jesus is the one who reveals God to us, who shows us who God is and what God is actually like. He's much harder to make in your own image. Hey, it's not that people haven't tried, but Jesus as that one who came into human history. Jesus is the one who dwelt among us Jesus is the one who said some very definite things and did some very definite stuff. 
Well, Jesus is harder to dismiss because Jesus reveals God to us. If we want to know God, then we get to know God through Jesus Christ. There is no other way, as Jesus himself reminds us. Jesus is the one who reveals God to us. And don't forget we have a responsibility to take account of that because the Word is our creator. When Jesus comes among us, of course he comes among us as a man, fully human, but he also comes among us as God. The one who rightly holds us to account. This is why we think about Jesus Christ's return as a day of judgment and salvation because Jesus Christ will hold all people everywhere to account for how they've responded to him. And he can do that because he's the creator. He made us. And then notice that the word is light and life. He shows us how we need to be. He is light, but he also offers life to us. And that brings us to the middle section of this passage. The word came as light and life. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Ah, we are back in the proper Christmas story at last. John the Baptist has appeared. That's a relief, okay? We can ground ourselves. More about him uh, as we go through uh, next week. But notice his role here. He is a witness, okay? He is a faithful witness. Faithful witnesses do this. They tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That is what John does. He is an example of a witness. This is what I have seen. John the Baptist witnesses about Jesus. Back to the light, verse 9. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Here is the true light who gives light. Notice the contrast here. Here is the creator of the world, and yet the world does not know him. Here is the saviour of Israel, the saviour of his people, and yet his people don't bother recognising him. This is what we mean when we talk about the light shining in the darkness. The darkness is the darkness of opposition, isn't it? It's the darkness of untruth. It's the darkness of rebellion against God. This is what Jesus came to face. And if we know anything about Jesus' story, we know that this is what happened. We know that he came into the world with a message of good news and was so often rejected. We know that he was rejected ultimately uh, so much that he, would, that he ended up dying on the cross. So this is a rather negative message, really, isn't it? He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But, verse 12, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But, says John, as he looks at the whole of the gospel story, some have received Jesus Christ. And those who've received Jesus Christ have been adopted as children of God. They have been, as he, Jesus will say in John chapter 3, they've been born again from above. And how does that happen? How does that adoption happen? How does that being born again from above happen? What is at stake here? How does this work? Well, it comes by believing in the name of Jesus Christ. One way of looking at John's gospel is to think of it as an extended, an extended uh, survey of what it means to truly believe. What does it mean to believe? in Jesus Christ. And what John will tell us as we go through, and this is what we need to start hearing now, is that believing in Jesus Christ is not simply saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he existed. Brilliant. Believing in Jesus Christ is about following him, recognizing him. Because to believe in Jesus Christ isn't just to believe in his existence, his reality, 
It's all to, to believe what he says. And of course, once we start believing what Jesus says, then we have to listen to what he says. Once we listen to what he says, then we realize that he is the one who tells us what it is that we need to do, how we need to live. He's the one who says to us, of course, famously, repent and believe. He's is the one who calls us to follow him. And so when we think about believing here, don't just, let's not make it into just this little intellectual thing, okay? This believing that we're talking about is a whole life of following Jesus Christ. And it's a whole life of following Jesus Christ that gives us the glory of being adopted as children of God. Here is the promise. Here is the offer. Here, right at the start of the gospel, is a reminder from John of why the one who came to earth, the one who created the universe, why it is that he came. And so we come to Jesus' coming, don't we, in this final section. The word of Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is where John comes into land, isn't it? We have seen him. Here is John, one of the disciples talking to us, reminding us of this truth. We have seen him. This is the incarnation. This is Jesus Christ taking on flesh. This is Jesus Christ being born of Mary. Jesus Christ who lived among us, sent from God, full of grace and truth. Now, at one level, that's just a nice description of who Jesus is, full of grace and truth. On another level, it's much more than that because it harks back to the words of Exodus 34, talking about God's character, God who is full of mercy, slow to anger and of great mercy. This is a God who is full of truth. It is his character, of course, his son, Jesus Christ, the word who comes to earth reflects his character. Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth. We get this little parenthesis in verse 15, uh, that bit within brackets. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. We're reminded of the historical circumstances. John hasn't gone away. Jesus came to earth at a particular time, in a particular place, was born of a very particular human family and grew up in a particular environment. When you read something like John's prologue with all its sort of elevated language, it can be tempted to think of sort of the word as some sort of very nebulous idea that kind of floats above the cosmos. That kind of thing that appeals to some people. Because obviously if it's nebulous and floating above the cosmos, it's not really going to hold you to account, is he? You can believe what you like about something that's nebulous. Sort of this Jesus of filling everything with everything. No, here is the Jesus who came and dwelt among us, was born at a very particular place and a very particular time, who revealed God to us, who still reveals God to us. Verse 16, and from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. See the focus of these verses, grace, grace, grace. What is grace? Grace is God's gift of salvation, isn't it? God is the fact that Jesus Christ came down to earth, unbidden, the light shining in the darkness. The darkness did not know it. The darkness did not want it. The darkness did not receive it. Darkness would rather it hadn't come. And yet Jesus Christ came into the world, bringing God's gift of salvation, grace and truth. God's Truth is God's word, uh, as John summarizes it as the law. What does it mean to live for God? What is, what is the truth about the universe? How are things really? That is what God's word tells us. It tells us how to live, and it tells us that we can't, that we very often, usually, perhaps we might say almost always, prefer darkness to light. You see, as soon as we start talking about grace and truth, we're talking about why we need it. We're very much into what it is that Jesus came to do and why he came to do it. Even here as we talk in these very exalted terms about light and life and the word and pre-existence and all that stuff, 
we still see the shadow of the cross, don't we? He came to his own, and his own did not know him. A light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Right at the beginning of the story, we know where this story ends. The story ends with the cross, but also with the resurrection. We are reminded, aren't we, of why it is that Jesus Christ came, why he needed to come for us and for our salvation, to save us from our darkness, our preference for darkness over light. And so a final reminder, verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. God is beyond our comprehension, beyond our understanding, infinite, the creator, some, someone we could never grasp and yet not unknowable because Jesus Christ has come to earth so that we might truly know God. So as we reflect on these words, which for many of us will be quite familiar, if only uh, from Christmas services year after year, as we reflect on these words, what is our response to them? What is it that we need to hear this day? Maybe we need to be reassured, first of all, of who Jesus is in a world which presents uh, many, uh, many opposing forces where, uh, again, more statistics this week, no great surprise that, that, that less than 50% of the population uh, are calling themselves Christians now. Okay? That doesn't surprise me. I don't think it surprises anyone. We knew that was coming. But in this sort of period of decline and, and, and things not going as we want them to go, we, we need to remember who Jesus is, don't we? He is the creator of all, the sovereign of the universe, the Lord. He is the one who we worship. Yes, of course, he's fully human, and we need to hold on to that. But we also need to cling on to the fact that Jesus Christ is fully God. There is nothing he cannot do. There is no power over which Jesus isn't Lord. So be reassured. Reass renew your relationship with Jesus Christ this Christmas. It is very easy sometimes, isn't it, to, to get out of the habit of knowing who Jesus is, to get out of the habit of walking with him, to forget, to take that relationship for granted. Hear this encouragement from John to renew our relationship with Jesus and then finally, of course, maybe what we need to do is actually genuinely to come to this Jesus Christ for the first time and to believe in him. And maybe that's something that we want to do this morning. Actually, we know who Jesus is, but maybe some of the words that we've heard from John's gospel fill in some of the gaps so that actually we can recognize for the first time that we really do need to come and trust in him as Lord and Savior, that we need to recognize that who he is and we need to actually follow him, not just sort of believe a bit around the edges, but actually follow him. Maybe that's where we're at this morning. Or maybe what we need to do is track through John. Keep coming. Keep looking at what Jesus is telling us. Keep looking at what John is telling us about Jesus through John's gospel, through Christmas, so that we might spend that time getting to know him, getting to know him better, that we might find what it really means to trust and to follow him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that Jesus Christ came and dwelt among us. As we uh, continue to reflect on that, we pray that we would be reassured knowing who Jesus Christ is. Amen.